Welcome to the second Women's Tech Maker series. This series highlights the stories of women in technology, especially women focused in social good. Our goal is to inspire women to get into te technology. And here at the Google Developers Network, we have tools to help you do exactly that. We are very excited to have with us today, Julie Hanna, the chairman of Kiva. My name is Radhika. I'm an engineering director here at Google. And I have been here for over 13 years working mostly in search. I was responsible for Google's image search and have lately been working on travel. My co-host tonight today is Anita. Anita. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Anita Ewan. I have been at Google for six and a half years. Spent my first four years uh, leading our marketing initiatives around Google's consumer search products as well as our homepage products. And I spent the last two years now leading our marketing initiatives around um, Google's technology for good, um, which includes things such as crisis response, um, energy and sustainability, uh, elections, as well as our giving initiatives. Thanks, Anita. And Julie. Julie, Julie Hanna is a serial entrepreneur. You have a wonderful, illustrious career, including being an advisor to various startups and working on several boards. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, it's it's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, I find at this, at my age, talking about yourself feels like a long laundry list of things. So, uh, forgive that. Um, I am. I say first and foremost, I'm a technologist. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a former CEO, executive, uh, and what I do today is I use those experiences to to help my fellow entrepreneurs and uh, uh, companies uh, kind of uh, go from that early conception stage into building companies at scale. And I do that in a number of capacities. Um, I am increasingly, um, the most meaningful, I'd say, manifestation of that for me is, is in uh, working with mission-driven entrepreneurs and companies, uh, particularly ones that sit at the intersection of technology and meaning. Uh, and meaning uh, uh, for me, kind of what I define by that is is a is an entrepreneur or a culture or a company that are driven by a purpose, by uh, by a mission, by a certain kind of uh, way of wanting to change the world, um, and that really defines my relationship to technology, which is really viewing it as. Um, I've always been most interested in the way that technology can be. Uh, it impacts our lives as human beings, how it, how it can move the human ecosystem forward, how it can uh, benefit us uh, both individually and at a group and on a global level. Um, and one of the things that um, I'm particularly driven around, I realize, is because of having had the experience of starting and building uh, a, a, a series of, of five companies uh, in an operating capacity, was that uh, doing that in the Silicon Valley context allows you to um, understand how to go from that early, the earliest stages to building a company at scale. And I think we do that here in Silicon Valley, I think in a, in a more highly optimized uh, manner than anywhere in the world. Um, taking those skills and harnessing them and kind of saying, okay, what are the world's biggest problems? Um, the, the boil the ocean problems that we've tended historically to think are intractable. Um, now with technology, um, I believe they're actually uh, quite accessible to us. Uh, and so that's really what drives and motivates me today. Thank you. So you're the chairwoman of Kiva. Could you tell us a little more about Kiva? what it does, what was the basic idea behind it? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think the best way to explain uh, what Kiva is is by talking about Kiva's first borrower. Um, seven years ago, Kiva's first borrower was a woman named Elizabeth Amala. She was a fishmonger living in Uganda and had five children. And she sold fish uh, by the roadside. Uh, but she wasn't able to make enough money to send her children to school. She was a single mother, uh, five young children. And with a $500 Kiva loan, uh, she was able to uh, make enough money to buy bus fare to go to Lake Victoria, which was about four hours away. And that allowed her to buy fish directly from the fishermen and cut out the middleman. And it also allowed her to buy a small refrigerator where she could buy larger quantities of fish uh, and with that $500, that one refrigerator, 
uh, that one bus ride, she was able to scale her business, increase her profits, and that allowed her to begin sending her children to school. And, and from, from that first borrower seven years ago, which was really the way that the, the, um, the, way that the, the money was gathered for that loan, it was crowdsourced, but in a very analog way. Uh, Matt Flannery and Jessica Jackley, the founders of Kiva, were on the ground in Uganda, and they wrote home to friends and family uh, because they believed if, if anybody had a chance to meet someone like Elizabeth and hear her story, that they would absolutely want to fund that loan. And they were overwhelmed with, with the friends and family sending in checks. And, and from there, uh, Matt, who was a, a, a programmer at TiVo, uh, and as he often says, I was spending my days and nights figuring out how people could click through uh, movies and TV uh, uh, much more efficiently. He sat down and he developed this website one night and kind of thought, how do I scale this up so that we can put more people like Elizabeth online? Um, fast forward seven years, and uh, today Kiva uh, has made and, and you, if you look at it, you can go to our website, or I think it's being displayed maybe on the screen. Um, we have now uh, about 300 and made about $380 million in loans, um, and we'll probably get to $400 million by around the year's end. Uh, December is a, is a big part of, of uh, our growth. Um, and that represents about 1 million people having made loans in 222 countries. And those loans have gone to about a million people in 66 countries. 81% um, of them are women, like Elizabeth. And uh, uh, that represents about half a million uh, unique loans. The average loan size is about $400. But our biggest loan, um, which we, we had last year, is, is uh, $50,000. So they run quite the gamut. Mm -hmm. um, the repayment rate hovers at about 99 percent, so very mm -hmm. high repayment rate. One of the things that I had someone from the banking industry recently point out to me is that um, it's a repayment rate that uh, uh, you know any bank is uh, is sort of lusting after or mm -hmm. envious of. Um, and so that's a little bit about Kiva in terms of the speeds and feeds. But really, I would say the most important achievement that Kiva has, has made, which is not, not as talked about, is that uh, when you look at the loans, it's easy to sort of look at the numbers and say, well, this is money going from this person to that person. But really, the money is just a symbol of something. Um, there's something far more important going on in terms of our humanity. And one of the greatest impacts is that, is that when people have access, to capital and are able to uh, be self-sufficient, it restores their dignity. And that's really, I would say, one of uh, Kiva's most important mm -hmm. achievements is right. seeing the, 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 the level of dignity that is restored with people when you meet the borrowers and you see kind of how their lives have been impacted. Uh, one of the first loans I made, which is sort of my, my own emotional favorite, um, is a loan uh, to, was a loan to a young group of women in Cambodia and you look at their picture, and they are, um, they've put, formed a sewing cooperative. And they're raising $730 for sewing machines. And so what, what I realized in reading their story was that these young women were, were survivors of uh, human sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it makes you think about a loan completely differently. This isn't just $700 and sewing machines. The sewing machine is a symbol for how this person is going to, is, is moving away from a, a life of save slavery to a life of freedom and empowerment and, and, and dignity. And when they repaid their loan, it wasn't, oh great, Kiva has a, a high repayment rate. It was a symbol, evidence, a marker of the fact that these women now were that much, one step closer, that much closer to that life of self-sufficiency and, and dignity. So that, that to me is, is really kind of uh, underlying it all, one of Kiva's most profound achievements. Mm -hmm. That's a lovely story. So 
so many stories so like many that. So many Kiva stories. Uh, almost a million to be exact. <laughs> Are there some more stories you'd like to tell us about your entrepreneurs? Well, I think what I would uh, say is that probably uh, in terms of stories, uh, th there I the thing that the thing that is really again maybe not talked about, but we kind of say this idea for Kiva is so counterintuitive. So if you think about really what a Kiva pioneer, Muhammad Yunus uh, was the inspiration for Kiva. He proved out that microfinance uh, could work at scale. And, and really what he was doing is proving two important things. One is that a tiny amount of money could have a disproportionate impact on the lives of the poor. The other is that the poor were in fact at excellent credit risk because the, the conventional wisdom in banking, um, uh, you know, since it's been institutionalized, has been to, uh, to exclude the poor and favor the, the, those with money because they're considered to be good for business. Um, so in a way, sort of, you know, you're a good borrower from a bank when you don't need the money, essentially. And that's been the conventional wisdom, and he flipped that on its head. Now what Kiva did was it brought micro lending to the internet and made it person to person. So here's where technology is taking something that was working on the ground level but amplifying it uh, across the globe, as we know that technology, in particular with the internet, can do. So, so, uh, so seemingly overnight, uh, Kiva uh, became a global phenomenon because of the power of technology. Uh, making it person to person was also um, ha had a very subtle but profound effect because what it did is it is it took people from uh, uh, closer and it humanized something that. And it caused us to think about uh, people living in poverty. Have half the world lives on less than two dollars a day, and we tend to think of people living in poverty largely through the lens of victimhood mm -hmm. and people that need a handout and need our help. Um, what what Kiva is has slowly done is changing people's perceptions that these are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They are resourceful business people. They are partners. When I make a loan to you, it's not a handout you repay me, you're my business partner. So, so that, that shift, that, that person to person connection um, is quite profound. The other part of it is that the, you know, the idea that, gee, someone's going to want to make a loan to somebody they've never met halfway around the world, that, that they think that $25 could make a difference, mm -hmm. that that person um, would actually want to repay that back to that random stranger, just it doesn't seem like an idea that would work and certainly not at scale. And yet it does, so you ask yourself, why is that? Why does this work? Um, and why does it keep working? And I think it fundamentally has to do with the person-to-person -person element, that, that we fundamentally want our lives to matter in small ways and in big ways. And part of that is one of the ways that we instinctively um, matter is by by being a part of each other's stories. We want to be a part of each other's stories. Mm -hmm. And so when I make a loan, uh, to someone when I made a loan to the, that Cambodian sewing co I, cooperative, in my mind, I became a part of their story. Mm -hmm. And when they repaid their loan, it told me that in some small way I played a small role in their story getting better. And I think that's really what propels uh, Kiva at scale. Mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit more about your lenders? Um, how often do they you know, get money back and reinvest? Mm -hmm. You told us some stories about the your entrepreneurs, can you tell us any stories from the lender's perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a really a great question. And it, it's where some of the insights around being a part of each other's stories has come from hearing the lenders t um, talk with great enthusiasm. I think that the, the, the things that I've uh, kind of hear from lenders and some of the lender stories are the realization that, uh, you know, our sense of, of the impact that a small amount of money can have uh, changes. You know, I've, when I go, sometimes I go to schools and, and talk to um, the fifth graders. Uh, the Kiva is very big in schools, and, and they raise money to make loans. And the way they raise money oftentimes is by having a lemonade stand, mm -hmm. right? And to, to hear those lenders connect the dots on, you know, that that uh, woman in 
Nigeria who has the vegetable stand that she's raising alone mm -hmm. for, that vegetable stand is not a lot different from my lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. Except that $25 or $100 makes a whole lot more difference for her than it does for me because what does a video game cost? Mm -hmm. You know, to even so, so even t uh, when you're as a young child, th that's those are the kind of impacts you have. Because the, the similarities, the universality of the human condition, the the when you read the borrower stories, I hear a lot of lenders say, "Gee, you know, they have the same hopes and dreams that we do." Mm -hmm. um, they can, they can. I can't believe um, how they can stretch the the money as far as they can. I can't believe they're able to repay those loans. Uh, and again, there is a there is a a, a a a change from these are victims to these are really powerful people that once they get the the access to the resources that they need um, can take it a lot further than any of us could. Mm -hmm. It's funny you use that example because the first time I really looked into Kiva was when my daughter's brownie troop had some money left over. And they were trying to figure out what to do. And they said, you know, instead of throwing a party, let's just open Kiva accounts. Mm -hmm. And so that's <laughs> what they did. And my daughter to date still goes back in and reinvests and reinvests. And <laughs> that's great. It's, it's really funny. I love yeah. hearing stories like that. <laughs> yeah. So let's they, they get a lot better, uh, a lot more uh, quickly uh, than, than we do as yeah. grown ups. It uh, it's really interesting to yeah, see. That's true. So let's talk about Kiva's API. Mm. You guys are very unusual. Most nonprofits don't go into that space, and I'm sure most people aren't aware of the fact that Kiva actually has a developer program mm -hmm. and an API. Mm. And I think that might be very interesting to our community here. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, I mean, first I'll start by saying that uh, I think one of the things that the, the what Kiva does, the impact it has, is so powerful. The story of it is so powerful that oftentimes. Um, what's missed is that that kind of at its heart, Kiva is a technology company in a lot of ways. It's a startup. It's like a tech startup with a social mission. And so, uh, what I what uh, when you look at the culture of Kiva and and you look at the kind of the engineering team and the way that it was built, there's there's a lot of that that DNA there. Um, then you overlay the fact that a lot of Kiva would not be where it's at without the community. The community effect. Uh, is just uh, is incredibly powerful. For example, we have um, I think we have around 400 translators around the world that, that mm. translate wow. the the loans uh, for our site, and and so there is this really powerful community network effect that from from the beginning, uh, I think we've really um, everyone at Kiva understands appreciates is so vital to Kiva's success and to its ability to thrive. Um, the API is really kind of born out of that about sort of you know wh what is the, what would the community want to do? We we think of Kiva as a platform. It's a marketplace. It's a person to person marketplace. Um, our community probably has a lot more ideas uh, and imagination about ways of extending that mm -hmm. than than we do. How do we just unleash that and let a thousand flowers bloom? So. Um, I think one of the, uh, maybe to bring that to life through an example, one of the more, m more powerful examples of that is um, the, the data visualization of mm -hmm. the Kiva loan activity um, that was done last year. Uh, and I think we have, um, do you have a video of that that you want to play? That might be, a, this might be a good time to show that. Yep. So what you're, see, what you're, what you'll see here is that this is the a data visualization of Kiva's loan activity from January 2005. We first uh, had the first loan uh, into uh, June of last year. And each light missile is an animal. The activity increases. That's when uh, PBS front <laughs> uh, uh, Frontline did a documentary, Nightline, um, and that really uh, told Kiva about the world. Um, Oprah discovered uh, Kiva. Bill Clinton wrote about it on his in his book on giving, and and that also um, drove a lot of awareness, a lot of activity. The the loans are color coded by type of loan. 
So you can see the hot spots um, starting to form. And as the loans get repaid, the, the light missiles go back. Across the $100 million mark in November of 2009. It's interesting which regions seem to pick up the right the lending activity for the recipient. Well. Yeah, 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 the hot spots. Yeah, two hundred million in March of last year. You can see the exponential growth there. So the, you can see those are where all the borrowers are located. These right. are the lenders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. So that's an example of the API in action. Um, uh, and you know, this is the kind of thing. This is really there's this is you know power in technology. Um, before that video um, was developed, we all had a sense of the numbers, but mm -hmm. but seeing it brought to life in this way, you kind of realize okay. In our first year, Kiva's first year, there were three thousand, uh, three thousand lenders, and, and reached about a million. And today. A loan is made every seven to eleven seconds. So far th this week, there's already we've already had, um, uh, I think it's fifteen hundred lenders. Actually, I'm not. Uh, we we grow every three days. We grow by a thousand lenders. Mm -hmm. um, we hit a million dollars in loans in mm -hmm. less than a week. So, and we, when you saw when there's just so much. Right insight you can gather from seeing the information visualized that way. So um, there's a mobile uh, app that, yeah. that someone did through the API. Um, so a yeah, lo lot of right. fun, interesting examples. So here at Google, we obviously deal with a lot of data. And so visualization tools are something we've really focused on. So we totally get the value of that. Mm -hmm. So what are the plans for Kiva going forward? Well, what do you hope that's it's a very it going? it's a very exciting time right now. Very exciting. Um, we have several um, exciting initiatives. I mean, the thing that 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 we lose sleep over is, um, you know, growth is impact. So the more people we can reach, the more lives that are being impacted. Right. The growth of Kiva has been, you know, impressive and and largely kind of fueled by technology and the community and the network effect. Um, and at the same time, you know, the numbers are massive. You know, nearly three billion people in the world don't have access to capital. Mm -hmm. So our mission of, of oh, I, I was at Kiva has democratized access to capital. Um, that's the lens I look yeah. at it through because I, th that's, that's the way exactly I look at technology done. is it's a democratizing exactly. force. So with um, what we look, what we think about now is. Uh, we expect to reach a billion dollars in loans in the next um, two to three years. Wow. Okay. That's very exciting, kind wow. of important mark right. for us. Um, our goal is to have a, a self-sustaining model at scale. So, you know, Kiva is a nonprofit, but I often refer to Kiva as a um, not-for-profit or mm -hmm. a for-revenue right. company because we have mm -hmm. a, a model of sustainability. Right. We're still investing in growth, um, just like young companies do because right. mm -hmm. we want to, um, we have a big market to address. Right. So uh, self-sustainability at scale, we see kind of on the horizon. Um, it, in terms of um, strategically, there's some very interesting and exciting things um, underway. Uh, we have had a pilot for the past year doing mobile loans. So, yeah. so a loan, um, our pilot's been between San, San Francisco and Kenya where um, you can make a loan uh, to the, and the borrower gets the loan mm -hmm. on their mobile phone. As they repay their loan, they can do that on the mobile phone. And so, w one of the things we're always thinking about is how yeah. do we make that lender borrower connection as strong as right. possible? And uh, Matt, the founder, CEO of Kiva, uh, expresses it really nicely because when we've, we've gone into the field and, and spent time with the borrowers and 
you have an experience, say, how do we take this experience we're having right now, real-time experience with this borrower, right. and export that to the mm -hmm. world? How do we get every Kiva lender mm -hmm. that experience? That's what we're always trying to use technology to recreate. Um, that The mobile lending brings them w one step closer to that. And we also think it's, go it's how we're going to reach the next billion people. Mm -hmm. right. So we talk about like a billion dollars yes. in loans, but how to reach a billion people in, in in, um, in ar around the world, and the phone is the way that that those pe that that those populations are coming online in a big way. Um, the other thing that's very exciting um, on the horizon is we are are have begun partnering with uh, uh, organizations that are not traditional, just traditional microfinance organizations. So we have about 150. Uh, microfinance partners around the world, and they're they're vital to Kiva's right. ability mm -hmm. to um, to scale, to kind of be in the field, and we work very closely with them. We've we've begun to partner with other types of organizations, um, uh, organizations like uh, Soul Sisters in uh, in mm -hmm. I believe in Uganda, yep. and what they do is they are basically a distributor of all kinds of. Uh, energy products, mm -hmm. oh, okay. and they are really working with uh, women on the ground to do that last mile of distribution. Mm -hmm. So now what, y what you have is a model that enables women to increase their in incomes um, and also serve energy poor parts of the world. And so partners like that are very exciting mm -hmm. uh, to me because you, a lot of these amazing organizations, the amazing products in the field, having a hard time really finding their market. Right. because they still lack the capital. Their mm -hmm. buyers still lack the capitals. Right. right. So you talked about the lending end, uh, about the receivers. What about, you've had programs, pilots in the past, where you've tried to get more people to try out Kiva, to pull them in. Do you have more plans like that to reach a yes. wider range of donors? I'm so glad you asked about that because actually one of the things I'm most excited about, I, I forgot to talk about, which is, so when you think about what Kiva has done effectively is um, kind of at the grassroots level, uh, people loaning $25 mm -hmm. or more at a time uh, and then kind of the scale of that. Because now we have, um, we are able to, uh, the world kind of sees, hey, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being lent here at a very high repayment rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the trust and the credibility and the proof, proof points are there in terms of repayment. Um, we increasingly have had uh, individuals and organizations say we'd like to lend larger amounts of mm -hmm. money, and so we we our first um, major loan we, we did with the fellow uh, Kiva board member um, Reed Hoffman, mm -hmm. who's a, the yeah. founder of LinkedIn, and we did a million dollar he did gave it did a million dollar loan right. with Kiva, and so what uh, what we did with that we said rather than just lend that directly we will actually allow people to have the loan experience using Reed's money. Mm -hmm. oh. And and that uh, and we called it free loan trials. Mm -hmm. So so what that did is not only it, did it put the million dollars, so in the case a million dollars reaches 40,000 borrowers, mm -hmm. um, but we actually brought a whole bunch of new nice. Kiva mm -hmm. lenders online giving that first loan using someone else funded by yeah. someone else. We just did that with TripAdvisor yeah. last week, uh, a really fun, exciting announcement. If you do a review on TripAdvisor, um, you can make a loan um, and TripAdvisor's footing the bill. So um, that's really has the sort of a real leverage effect there because we can expose Kiva to more people right. and then we're putting mm -hmm. larger amounts of money into the system um, in more concentrated fashion. Um, th the way I think about Kiva is we all get kind of trained in terms of financial management uh, to have these diversified portfolios. Right. You put some money in fixed incomes and in cash and in stocks mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. et cetera. And, and so what I, what, you know, I dream of a world where we, um, where people think about Kiva or what some of what we sometimes call connected cava capital as an investment right. class, an mm -hmm. asset class where you say, we're parking tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars in the bank, and the bank benefits. No one else really benefits. We don't benefit. Mm -hmm. um, what if we put that money to work lending to others, um, and we can withdraw that money at any point in time? You know, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we want to do that? So and I, I think many right. people would agree with you as well. I think there have been studies today that talk about at least seventy-five percent of people 
or have the intention of giving, but don't for some reason, whether right. it's due to um, not, uh, you know, maybe requiring research or needing to understand a little bit more about it. But I think what Kiva does is really simplify the experience, make it easy for people to understand mm -hmm. what they're contributing to, and even things like the mobile. I think uh, there's a great opportunity there as well in terms of opportunity. So that, that's great that you guys are thinking along those lines. Um, I want to take let's this let's opportunity yeah, to to, um, to talk a little bit more about you. So we'll shift gears a bit. Um, you have an incredible background and career, and you know you've worked on products that have um, reached over ten, tens of millions of people. And you worked on consumer internet as well as enterprise, email communication, social networking, gaming. What drove you to to Kiva? And what drove me to Kiva, I think, was um, stepping back a few years ago, uh, a number of years ago, at the height of my professional success, um, privately feeling uh, uh, a personal failure or kind of an emptiness and a questioning. And that, that started me on, on this journey of kind of saying, okay, what really matters most? Um, um, rather than, you know, doing this again, um, you know, the satisfaction that I realized that came with just sort of, you know, pure professional achievement um, at best was fleeting. Mm -hmm. and, and it left me sort of wondering, gee, is this all there is? Uh, and, and I was pretty exhausted and burned out. And, and so I took that time to really step back and kind of say, really, what's driven me? What's my relationship to technology been all of these years? And in that, I discovered a few things. Um, one of those was when I connect to sort of what I'd done professionally with my own personal history. Um, you know, you, you mentioned my bio, you know, all the things that my bio says. Um, I'm all those things. I'm a, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur who's benefited disproportionately from being in this thriving ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one of the most successful ecosystems in the world. And you know, we call it the tech bubble a lot of the times. I also have come to think of it as a bubble of privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to forget that because bubbles are clear and you don't know that you're in a bubble often and we normalize our environments. Um, but, but because of my personal history, in addition to being uh, all of those things, my journey to the kind of front lines of the tech revolution started on the front lines of war. Um, I'm an Egyptian immigrant, and uh, I'm a refugee of war, and I spent the, the you know, first many years of my life kind of fleeing war, de living in pretty adverse circumstances, um, uh, living in poverty, and watching my parents struggle to make ends meet. And, uh, and that instilled in me kind of, um, I think it sensitized me to issues of injustice, um, seeing what a lack of access um, does to a person, how it defines people, how people treat you when you mm -hmm. don't have access. I remember, um, you know, in my mind, we were just a family sort of getting, you know, through things. There were, we were no different from anyone else, but we had our own kind of, you know, challenges. Um, but what I would notice is the way other people looked at us. Um, when we, in, after we immigrated to the United States, and, and you know, one of my most vivid memories is that they would look at us often through eyes of pity, mm -hmm. and they would, in a very well-meaning way, offer us um, a handout because they thought, you know, charity was the best mm -hmm. way to help us. And charity did help us at crucial times, but what it also did was it chipped away at our dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and after a while, what happens with that is you start to um, internalize um, that lens of how people are looking at you, and then that can be incredibly disempowering. Mm -hmm. So all of those things really instilled in me kind of a, a sense of um, being very driven around issues of fair access, um, wanting to bring justice to the world. Um, I was lucky enough to have gotten the sense from my father that there was nothing I couldn't do. So I felt a, a drive about that, despite mm -hmm. my circumstances. And um, that's all kind of a long way of saying that uh, I kind of walked around um, feeling this, this thing that we sometimes hear about, which is sort of that talent is universal, but opportunity isn't, mm -hmm. and that it's not a level playing field, even in the land of equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I came out of college, when I looked at technology, I really viewed technology as a democratizing force, as a great leveler. 
uh, and it and and it it did give uh, fair access to people who didn't have it before, mm -hmm. and that's really been what drove me in my career first around digital communications and email. That uh, when I looked at email in the 80s. I, in the lab, I kind of said, you know, I think one day we're all going to communicate this way. This is mm -hmm. going to be like the phone. Yeah. Um, but in searching for that deeper meaning and bringing alignment to my work in terms of what I held most dearly, sort of that really led me towards um, the work that Kiva was doing and, issue and looking at empowerment and democratizing forces. I think technology is the most democratizing force mm -hmm. the planet's known. Um, I also came to believe that um, entrepreneurs are the biggest change agents mm -hmm. in the world, and so how could how can you how could I help uh, technology entrepreneurs mm -hmm. have a greater impact in the world? And and that's really sort of what what led me uh, towards Kiva, uh, and sort of some of the philosophical threads underpinning that. Probably a longer answer that you wanted to know. No, well, that's <laughs> no, that's great. I think there, you've touched on a few points. There's when, when I heard as soon as you mentioned um, how your father said, "There's nothing you can't be doing," right. and then you mentioned a level playing field. Immediately, I thought of the baseball story. Maybe oh. you can share with our folks here what, <laughs> a little bit more about the baseball story. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, Megan must have had something to do with <laughs> this. I don't know how that secret got out. Yeah, so you know, uh, my family moved to the U.S. Um, I, as a young girl, I was discovering everything American, and what you know, nothing more American than baseball. And I, I loved baseball, uh, was deeply passionate about baseball. And my family had moved to a small southern town, really small, um, and so small that we were known as the foreign family because we were basically the, <laughs> the only non-American yeah. family in town and um and i i discovered baseball and i i said this is great i want to play and i was quickly told that i couldn't play baseball because it's a boys only sport and the uh, little league baseball i guess was and probably still is uh and that just seemed deeply inju unjust to me mm -hmm. and i was kind of determined to appeal my case to someone and, and largely a bunch of adults that were apathetic. I mean, nobody really cared. They're like, yeah, get over it. You know, you can go play in the backyard kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was really determined. The idea that someone couldn't, could or couldn't do something based on who they were um, really hit me and probably because of everything I'd experienced at that point. You know, doing it because um, the, the, the fact that someone could or couldn't do something because of whether they were a boy or a girl really got my back up, mm -hmm. and I was determined to prove girls could do anything boys could do. And uh, somewhere along the way, I learned about Title IX, which had just mm -hmm. been passed. And I, mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, Title IX was the Equal Opportunity Act yeah. um, that basically said that if if a sport was being offered in, to one gender, it had to be made available to both. It was very new; not many people knew about it. And if it were today, I would have gone on the internets <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, found the Google and looked it up and. And uh, you know, it said, "How do I play baseball?" And all this great information. Mm -hmm. Well, then it, that wasn't the case, so it took a little kind of detective work. So on the day of baseball registration, I decided I had sort of the, the law on my side, and I marched to City Hall, which is where you b register for baseball. And to this day, I remember walking up and uh, really being terrified because you know it's all a bunch of grown-ups, and I was mm -hmm. as 12 at the time. And walking up to the window and uh, saying, they said, "Well, you know, what are you doing here?" And well, I'm here to register for baseball. And uh, this elderly uh, Southern woman looks down at me, and I could see she's that that look of pity. She's like, "Oh, bless your heart, hun. <laughs> Girls don't play baseball." <laughs> <laughs> and now run along, and yeah. uh, and so I gave her a filibuster on Title IX, and uh, and I don't know if they eventually relented because I wouldn't shut up, or if they saw the light, but they let me play baseball, and uh, it was it was a, a, a pretty horrific thing for a small town to have a girl play mm -hmm. baseball. It really kind of upset everybody's ideas about the way things were supposed to be. Um, but what what I think was was really interesting in hindsight was. You know, I like to think that I changed those attitudes just a little bit uh, about the fact that girls can do anything boys can do. And in hindsight, I actually realized that it taught me um, kind of almost all the vital things 
that I needed to know about entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. I think of on, uh, entrepreneurs as activists, really. It was, it, was an acti it was activism, but activists and entrepreneurs have a lot in common, and so I, I, I draw a lot on that experience uh, to this day. Great. Well, maybe you can talk about that a little bit more. So, as you know, been you've been a CEO, clearly you're a board chairperson, uh, a founder, entrepreneur. What are other ingredients that you apply to sort of secrets of success? I always feel like an imposter when I'm asked that question because um, <clears throat> I can't say that I've really had a a methodical way of looking at my career and I don't you know I walk around saying well here's my secret sauce let me pull some yeah. out of my pocket and and add it to to this meal but uh, if anything I would attribute uh, I think one there's a definitions of success that I challenge sort of there's social societal definitions of success and and the question is can we define our own personal definition of success that isn't um, entirely defined by external things. Uh, the other is that not worrying about success would be my secret <laughs> sauce if I had one. Mm -hmm. I never thought about whether I'd be successful or not. And I don't mean that in a glib way. I, you know, I kind of imagine like someone watching this going, oh yeah, easy for you to say, but uh, at this point, because, you know, gee, you've been fortunate, and I have been fortunate, um, but I think part of not worrying about success is, uh, and not having goal orientation, and all that. it's not that you're not clear about why you do what you do, it's not that you're not driven, it's just that you don't have a predisposed idea about what the outcome is going to be like, and mm -hmm. I, I meet, um, I meet young people and entrepreneurs all the time who are so with it, so together, and they come up to me and they say, you know, here's what I did, and they're well educated, and, and I look at them and they, God, you're way more together than, you know, I am now, much less mm -hmm. when I was your age. Uh, but sometimes I think what's happened is we have fallen prey to thinking we can codify everything. Yeah. So, you know, talking mm -hmm. about technology, right? It's like, what's the program for success? And I think there are definitely markers for success, but I think we can become slaves to those. So mm -hmm. a, a gift for me is I had no idea about any of that. And what that did is is I'm, I thrive on learning and not having any, not thinking about the outcome. I was driven by what my values were. What am I trying to do? I want to do something important. I want to have impact. I want to, I want to do something significant. Um, I want to learn, and that created sort of just an openness and a sense of adventure. Whenever I took a, a new job, I never thought about whether I can be successful or not. What I mm -hmm. thought about is, you know, can I do what, what well, I they need, this. and can I have an impact, and is this going to matter? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, one of the things that came out in a reference check years ago that someone did on me was, um, which I, I was deeply hurt by at the time, and I realized it's absolutely true about me, is that when I'm motivated around something, there's no stopping me. And if I'm not motivated, I'm like a different person. Mm -hmm. And so really what has always propelled me is that passion mm -hmm. and that desire to learn um, and, and then being driven by the value, the, uh, the meaning, the what, what's this for, the why. Why am I doing this? Not what do I do, why am I doing it? Do I deeply believe in this? And, and that's how I think about startups. I mean, startups are all about, you know, we're going to go change the world in this way. So that just has always kind of really propelled me. Wow, that's wonderful. And I imagine you'd be a role model for many of us if you're watching it or around us here. Maybe um, you can tell us a bit more about your role model. I and mean, you mentioned your father earlier in terms of a quote you sort of go back to in terms of not accepting the sort of the status quo and there's nothing you can't do. Are there other uh, role models that you look to up in your life? That's, this is the other question I really hate <laughs> getting. Well, I'm glad I'm I can guess, ask you these Thank questions you. <laughs> that you don't like. <laughs> um, there are so many. I, I think uh, I didn't grow up saying, God, this is one person. I'm going to sort of, you know, really model after them. I think our role models in many ways are people that we don't know who they were until much later and look back mm. and say that person has such a formative, because it's more implicit than explicit. Um, and I certainly have those people in my life. Um, I think one of the things I realized I do is, and this is probably comes out of the curiosity and the learning back to G Secret Sauce, I think I'm kind of just naturally a learning machine. 
I'm just, al and I always find something to learn from everybody that I meet. And it's, you know, now I try to make it conscious, but I, but it was just always sort of who I was. And so um, there's nothing that, um, everyone has something to teach us. I really believe that, and I can look back on my people that um, I uh, didn't like working with, people I struggled with, uh, you know, everybody has something to teach you, and so I have, in many ways, everybody I've ever come in contact with is is a role model in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, one one I would say the other thing is I always look at, at who am I surrounding with myself that's a source of inspiration for me, and I think we need that. Mm -hmm. Um, to be our best as human beings, and which is why it's such an important question, even yeah. though I'm giving you a hard time about it. Um, and I would say maybe kind of since we're talking about Kiva, mm -hmm. uh, there are three people that come to mind. I'll just sort of, um, uh, one of them, long time hero who, I, who I'm, you know, uh, pleased to say uh, is now a friend is Muhammad Yunus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason he's a role model for me is because um, he, uh, connects sort of very tangible on the ground humanity mm -hmm. to kind of the broadest principles and he is an agent of change in that way but he's not lost his humanity and his capacity to connect in that way and I think that and that's really what fuels his power what he has been doing is a he's able to do is he takes that and he can abstract that into very broad and important, powerful principles to change the world, and I deeply admire that. Mm -hmm. It's something I aspire to. Um, I would say that um, a, another source of uh, daily inspiration for me is Matt Flannery, mm -hmm. um, the founder and CEO of Kiva. Uh, Matt brings such uh, an integrity and a commitment uh, in his work, and I would say that uh, he he is. Uh, you know, we never always live from our why, but he, um, maybe as much as anyone I know, is is connected to that. It's easy to do that when we do the work that we do at Kiva, but I see a lot of people doing mission-driven work where you get disconnected from the why. Mm -hmm. And and he has that compass uh, of integrity, and he is very human. Again, he brings his humanity to, to his work uh, and to the way he is in the world, and I deeply admire that. Uh, and then uh, the, the last person that comes to mind is somebody I mentioned earlier who's a uh, fellow board member and, and also a, a, a dear friend and colleague is Reed Hoffman. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Reed um, has found a way to manifest sort of, you know, what he values on, a, on a, a large scale and he's retains that kind of integrity and humanity. So I guess those are, integrity and humanity and, and values yeah. maybe are the things that are really inspiring to me. Well, those are amazing people to be surrounded by. So uh. before we run out of time, we have a few questions from the audience. Do you okay. want to read it? Sure. Uh, so the top one is self-sustaining model at scale. Can you talk about how you are intending to make the mobile loans self-sustaining and at scale? Oh, that, oh, just start out with a really hard <laughs> question. <Yeah. laughs> so the, the mobile loans, so the, the way that Kiva's model uh, is that uh, uh, in terms of how we support ourselves. When you make a loan, um, the 100% the of the, the lender's money goes to the borrower that they've chosen to lend the money to. And then when you check out, when you sort of say, okay, I want to make this loan, we give you the option to uh, make a donation to Kiva. We call it a tip, basically, mm -hmm. to tip us like you would in a restaurant. And that's our uh, revenue model. That's, that's our earned income model. So it's the same with mobile loans as it is with the, if you make a loan on a, on a website today. Um, how we, how d we're going to make mobile work at scale is something we're still figuring out. Um, it's, it's one of the biggest strategic questions on the table right now, so I, I, I can't really elaborate <laughs> on, on, on that right now. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you have any great ideas for us, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> so before we close, do you have any advice for young entrepreneurs, especially young women trying to get into technology? Yeah, I would say the thing that helped me the most is, and it's so much easier to do this today, is I would um, connect the dots, uh, connect the dots on what is it about technology you love. 
connect the dots between technology and something you're really passionate about. Because I, I think that um, I think that when you do that, that will tap the creativity, the innovation, the passion uh, for your work. So you know, today technology is so much about what can we enable what what parts of the right. what parts of our lives of the world is it going to change enable okay what what are the things that you care about um, and then think about what role can technology play here um, rather than just looking at things through a pure technology lens that really helped me i mean my only way of being able to do that when i was uh, coming in college was by um, co the co-op program where you could go figure out an applied way of of using computer science and I became a programmer and I learned a lot about what my day to day life was going to be like and I quickly realized really what I care most about is how it's going to affect our lives and that guided sort of the first job I took out of college and that got me going on a trajectory so it's really sort of connecting the dots. Okay. Great. I think we're out yeah, of time. Yeah, I think we're out of time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been great hearing about learning about Kiva as well as your um, inspiration, hearing about all the inspiration that you bring to everyone around through Kiva as well as all the CEOs and entrepreneurs that you help coach today. Um, we want to thank you for joining us for the second uh, series of World Te uh, Women Tech Makers. We're here again tomorrow, 2.30 uh, p.m. PST with Jen Palka for Code for America. And uh, stay tuned to learn more about tech women for social impact. Thanks.